buonasera. Buongiorno a tutti. Buone. Buona puntata di Dialogo su Italia. Ciao. Ciao. Buongiorno a tutti e benvenuti a questo nuovo appuntamento dei dialoghi di Urbisaglia. E oggi abbiamo con noi un ospite che per me personalmente è un, un mito personale, è un, eh, il professor Simon Gilson, che è eh, professore di Italian Studies a Oxford. Eh, buongiorno Simon. Eh, Simon parla in italiano meglio di me, eh, per oggi la nostra conversazione sarà in inglese, un omaggio anche alla uh, sede oxoniense del, del nostro ospite. E, eh, Simon ha insegnato, studiato italiano, eh, letteratura italiana a Leeds e ha ricevuto il suo dottorato, il suo PhD eh, a Cambridge. E ha insegnato in eh, molte università, e oggi insegna italiano e serena professor, prestigiosissima cattedra di italiano a Oxford e, e i suoi interessi sono da sempre concentrati sulla eh, letteratura italiana rinascimentale e sulla ricezione di Dante, eh, come eh, molti dei, dei nostri ascoltatori eh, sapranno. Simon ha recentemente pubblicato in italiano la traduzione di uno dei suoi volumi più importanti che è questo volume Leggere Dante a Firenze da Boccaccio a Cristoforo Landino che è la traduzione del suo volume Dante and Renaissance Florence pubblicato anni fa, 14-15 anni fa dalla Cambridge University Press. Ma non solo, eh, Simon ci ha anche regalato ultimamente un altro volume che è l'ideale eh, continuazione del, di Dante Renaissance Florence, che è invece questo più completo, Reading Dante in Renaissance Italy, Florence Venice and the Divine Poet. Allora, e noi oggi parleremo appunto di questo interessantissimo tema che è la ricezione di Dante. Eh, nel rinascimento italiano, nel più ampio rinascimento italiano, non solo fiorentino, e eh, eh, da un punto di vista sia letterario sia materiale, sia quindi della storia del libro, che è l'argomento che più ci interessa nei nostri dialoghi. Ok, uh, we can start our conversation in, uh, about, about Dante. And uh, just a first uh, question about how. Uh, this interest of yours about Dante in Renaissance, uh, of the, the Renaissance reception of Dante stuff. Uh, yeah, first well, of all, first of all, thank you. Thank you for inv inviting me to, to speak in this interview. It's a pleasure to do that. It's a pleasure to do it with you, who I know are a very formidable young scholar in Dante and reception are in, and are teaching me lots of writing oh. and new original things about the print reception of, of Dante. So, It's great to have this 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 conversation. Um, I, Grazie. <laughs> I I um I I navigated towards Dante and reception. So I did my PhD thesis was originally on science in Dante. So it was on a it was on a more rigidly and confined medieval topic. But of course, during the course of that PhD, I was reading a lot of Renaissance commentators. And I was working on, I was actually working on optics and light in Dante. And so that inevitably brought me into, into the Quattrocento, the 15th century, uh, the 16th century as well. So I had, I had interests in those areas. I was originally divided about whether I might actually do a PhD on a Renaissance topic, but I chose Dante instead. Um, in, in, and sometimes these, these decisions are difficult. Um, and I became, I became interested in, in Cristoforo Landino's commentary, um, probably in the mid-90s. Someone asked me to give a paper 
on astrology and magic in Dante and suggested, Peter Armour actually, uh, uh, and suggested that I push a little bit forward into, into the Renaissance period. And I did that in a period when it was, it was very difficult, pre-digitalization, it was very difficult to get copies. Um, I didn't travel to Italy that much in those days. Um, and so I spent lots of time transcribing the Landino editions that I could find in rare books rooms in Cambridge, Birmingham, Leeds, um, not Oxford at that point. Um, and, and really starting to study hard um, the, um, the Landino commentary and read as much of the available criticism that I could. Um, I kept coming back to the celebrated Dionisotti essay, um, La Fortuna di Dante nel, nel, nel Quattrocento, um, that celebrated essay that really opens up an amazing geographical, historical panorama um, in quite a short space um, onto Dante's reception in, in the 15th century. And that was always a, that was always a, a, a fundamental point of, point of reference for me, but also, but also a point of departure too, because I wanted to not so much correct or update Dionisotti, but, but give more give more space to Dante then in, in the period from, from the middle of the middle of the 14th century up to the Landino commentary, 1481, the first Florentine print commentary, which, which I saw as a, as a key landmark, if you like, in the Renaissance reception of Dante, in the Florentine reception of Dante, and subsequently in the Italian reception of Dante. But I mean, the Landino commentary, as you know, actually has a transnational, a transnational dimension um, too as well. Um, so, so that was, so that early beginnings of studying just one tiny topic, scientific rela related, like my thesis, um, my original thesis, started to open up much wider vistas, um, you know, fascinating, exciting vistas on what at that stage was a book on the Florentine reception of Dante. But I knew that the Florentine reception of Dante couldn't be separated off artificially from, from other reactions and contexts. So although I started that first book in 1350, um, I knew that there was a, there was a very important, complex, um, effervescent um, hinterland, if you like, of activity across the Italian peninsula. It's better than having studied hard and really well the Neapolitan reception of Dante. Um, so I knew that there was that early reception of Dante, but I nonetheless took 1350 as a starting point because it seemed to me to be a fundamental moment in the, in the Florentine and the humanist reaction to Dante, the meeting of Boccaccio and Petrarch and the discussions that I knew, but I imagined them having in relation to Dante, the gifts that were sent, um, the kinds of accommodations they were making of Dante within their, their literary and cultural and intellectual systems at that time. Let me, go, let me go back to you. I mean, you might want to say more. The, uh, it still would be good, I think, if someone, someone were to write a... So although I then wrote a companion book from, from Landino, so from 1481, to the beginning of the 17th century. Another book that could have been written was the book from, well, one could take it from before Dante's death, the, the, the partial circulation we imagine of parts of, and reception of parts of the Inferno um, in, Dante's, in Dante's lifetime. Um, so the, 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 the reception of Dante before at the end of his death and up to 1350 as well, would make for a very rich and fascinating book, not only in Dante commentary and glosses and manuscripts as well. I mean, it may be that someone like Anna Pegoretti will put together a, a, a book along those lines, but... But, um, but um, well, that could be fantastic. I mean, yeah. to, for, for, for the Dante studies, I mean, could, I mean could, could be a perfect path of reconstruction of this very long and intense uh, reception of a literary work, which many... Uh, critics was the most read books of the late medieval age after the Bible, of course. What was fascinating, in my opinion, uh, the first time I read your book on Landino was the excellent and amazing contextualization of the topic of Dante's reception in 
the broad cultural uh, Florentine humanistic and pre-humanistic environment. So Dante, you show that basically that Dante was not this uh, bad guy villain for the, human, human, the, the Florentine humanist as uh, we were used to learn from the previous uh, critics. So uh, that Niccoli was uh, the, the one who first criticized Dante and to him represented the symbol of the bad the scholastic culture, uh, which was the enemy of the true humanistic uh, new culture. So this is one of the greatest merits of, of your book. And now the Italian readers can also, also, also those who don't know English can, can read them. But starting from, uh, uh, um, let's say, a book history perspective. Oh, so what is the revolution to you? your opinion that Landino's commentary and so the um, Niccolo della Magna's enterprise uh, give to the world of uh, uh, the, the Renaissance reader? Yeah, so the, I mean, the Landino comment, commentary is an edition, is, is, I mean, it's a huge, it's, it's a huge fo folio edition. So it's the real full scale um, edition. It's, it's actually quite hard to pick up if we could go into rare books rooms in libraries now, it'd be a great pleasure to, to be able to do that again. We're starting to. Um, one has to be careful how one handles it. You know, if one were to drop it on the floor, that would be, you know, the act of greatest literary commentatorial sacrilege there could there could be. So it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a monumental edition. It monumentalizes Dante and recovers Dante for Florence. So it's, it has a, the Landino edition has a huge prologue. So it has a huge introductory section um, divided up into multiple sections that deal with um, what, who Dante is and what he means to, to Florence, both um, past Florence and contemporary Florence. So, um, uh, and of course, Dante, Dante, as you were just saying, potentially does have a bitter taste of Florentines. One thinks of all those invectives against the Florentine state. Um, one thinks of the difficulties of exile of some of Dante's letters um, that, that, um, that clearly were, 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 were very disparaging towards, towards Florence. So Landino is very careful in the opening couple of chapters of that prologue, he repositions Dante, making clear that Dante um, was a true Florentine patriot, that anything that untoward he might have said about the Florentine state required careful contextualization, that he also praised many, many of Florence's citizens and institutions. So there's a strong act of recuperation of Dante that um, is not just a historical act. Landino is very aware that, that, that Dante is being printed elsewhere in Italy, yeah, uh, at this point. And again, for a Florentine like Landino, a patriotic, chauvinistically minded Florentine um, like Landino, this is an act of, of sacrilege again, almost, um, of expropriation of, of, of their, own, their own domain, if you like. Um, and what, what is worse is the, the most recent edition, the Milanese edition. The Milanese, the Nido Beato edition. Sino Paolo Nibia, Nido Beato edition had actually reprinted an earlier commentary, but a Bolognese commentary. And in the, in the introduction to the Nido Beato commentary had praised Bolognese as the best vernacular above all others. So really that is what we say in English, a red rag to the Florentine <laughs> Andino at this point. Um, and actually there's a subtle dialogue with Nido Beato all the way through Landino's commentary. Landino actually borrows quite a lot from it, more, than, more from it, and it would be a good area to study more, in more depth. I don't study it in as much depth as I perhaps should have done in, in, in the first book. Um, but non, nonetheless, what Landino is doing is appropriating, reappropriating Dante for Florence against all these other foreigners, i.e. the other Italian states that are printing and trying to lay claim on Dante. And then Landino gives a life of Dante in the prologue, um, starts to celebrate uh, Laurentian, so the, the, the Florence of Lorenzo de' Medici, and all the cultural activity in learning, in the arts, in literature, in philosophy, um, stressing how much Dante is, is, is an engine, a motor, and, and a part of that. 
Then he moves into the commentary proper, and the commentary proper, um, you know, extends over well over a thousand pages in um, in the modern critical edition, the fantastic critical edition um, by dear Paolo Procaccioli. That, that that edition in four volumes um, um, is mostly the glows, the chiosa, the commentary proper. Um, but there's still a you know that. Prologue is very substantial, certainly compared to other Dante commentaries. That chiosa, that, that commentary proper, builds on a lot of the early Dante commentary tradition. Benvenuto de Imola um, um, and Francesco da Buti um, in particular, um, but also Boccaccio, to some extent, Pietro Alighieri, Nido Beato, as I've mentioned already. But it makes it into a very intelligent, reframed, um, Glose that is always animated by Landino's own intelligence and interests and prose style, yeah, and that's not to be neglected. Even in the 1520s, 1530s, people were talking about Landino as a prose stylist, and then that shifted away with the Bembis, the Bembis solution. Um, and Landino, Landino too adds his own elements. So he has interesting things to say about science in Dante, about astrology, about classical culture, about Dante's philosophical interests. He has interesting, um, an, an interesting revitalized allegorical interpretation of Dante built on a whole theory of, um, of the soul um, and, 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 and of the senses as well. So again, there are lots of really interesting elements within that, within that Landino commentary. And because it is this great summer of the early tradition, it's this updated vision of Dante. It's, it's, it's got all these kind of elements, it's got lots of Neoplatonism, Florentine Neoplatonism. It never quite went out of date. And so it keeps being reprinted in the 16th century in one in one form or another, it's probably one of the one of the most widely reprinted and reused um, books in 16th century Italy. You know, 15, 16 reprints, um, and an after until the until the 1595 and the until the end of 50 of 16th century, and uh, but it was uh, put uh, with uh, together with uh, uh, so connected with the text by uh, edited by. Pietro Bembo, which was not exactly the one Landino used to make his commentary, isn't it? Um, one question about this, as you said, 16th century portion. Again, we are used uh, in, the, in the Italian university until a couple of years ago to uh, learn that Dan, the, the 16th century is the century of Petra, when the moment when Dante's fortune decreased exponentially. Is it true? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, it's, I mean, I think that's an extreme characterization, but of course it is true at certain levels. So what, we have 230 print editions plus of Petrarch as opposed to 20 maximum of Dante. So uh, cl clearly at, at certain levels, um, and, and certainly in terms of a linguistic solution to the problem of um, a more unified Italian language, Dante then is his roughness, his stylistic openness, um, his kind of versatility, his range, his inclusion of everything um, is, is problematic for, certainly for Pietro Bembo, the linguistic theorist, um, in the Prosi della de Vogue Lingua, which sets the normative models, certainly, certainly by, 50, by, by 1540, 1550, for, for Italian language, and printing reinforces, uh, to a large degree, um, those, those, models, those models too. So Dante is, to some extent, marginalised, is to some extent um, not a stylistic model, is inconvenient, becomes even more problematic too when one thinks of his attitude towards the papacy as we move into a climate of increasing religious orthodoxy and the policing of that religious orthodoxy. Um, however, there still is space for Dante and, and taking the raw figures of print editions alone, you can miss some, you can, well, you miss for a start the continuing and vast manuscript circulation um, of, of Dante's poem. 
you, 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 you can miss the activity that goes on in academies, which are the real seats and centers of vernacular learning. And there are many of them right throughout Italy. And of course, many of the lectures are on Petrarch or on Bemba and others. But actually in many of the academies too, Dante is lectured on quite consistently and quite repeatedly and strongly. Certainly the case in Florence. Um, where, where, you know, we have a continued, and in fact, one of the chapters of the book, it deals with Giovanni Battista Gelli and his over 10 years of reading Dante until it was too hot and he had to give up in the summer and then start back again in September. Um, reading Dante every, every year. And even stylistically, as, 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 as we know, um, the, great, the great poets of the century, Ariosto Tasso, in their different ways, are constantly repeating, repeating, echoing, um, competing with, with Dante at, at, at various levels. And because Tasso is so popular then in the, the 17th century, Dante gets re-echoed through Tasso <laughs> into the 17th century potentially too as well. And you know, I think it's, it's still true in the 17th century when we have only three print editions of Dante, that nonetheless, and you know, there've been good recent works, um, Marco Arnaldo um, uh, uh, and others working on, and I think more work still could be done on the 17th century reception of Dante. Dante is alive um, at so many, at multiple levels and across multiple cultural layers um, still, um, even, even though he is stylistically, ideologically, politically, religiously, potentially um, inconvenient, if not, um, if not heterodox. Um, um. And then there is also the other, another topic, which is the international, in, in contemporary terms, fortune of Dante in Spain, France, Middle East, England, Germany, North, Northern Europe, which is still, I mean, the, Nick Heavily has studied deeply the fortune of uh, uh, Dante in, uh, in England, uh, but we don't know enough still to the actual 14th, 15th century uh, fortune or spread of Dante's, at least comedy, in the broader European uh, geographical context. There are old uh, uh, books, old studies about this topic, but when the uh, uh, amount of material was not enough to create a systematic uh, study, as we have now the possibility to do. Um, uh, but for example, the, the, the Catalan reception of Dante, which was, uh, which was huge. Uh, there were readers in the 14th and the 15th and the 16th, even in the 16th century. Who knows, maybe also Shakespeare read Dante, but we don't know it. We know that Milton for sure read Dante uh, in that in this probably lost copy of the 1568 edition of the Divine but, Comedy but with the, the Daniello, yeah. Exactly, with the in the convivio as well, in in some of the Renate, remember the Dante's convivio, um, his own prosimetrical treatise on some of his early early canzoni. Um, um, was printed um, three times in the 16th century. Milton owned one of those copies. So there, you know, there is also also not Dante just of the the Commedia, either. There is there is there is the other the other Dante in production um, as well. But yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think there is a lot more work that could be done um, on Spanish, French, English, um, German. Um, receptions of Dante, and that we're begin. I think we're we're probably beginning to get the tools with the opening up of libraries through the digital programs to be able to to start to do that um, in a in a in a more systematic way. Um, but it would be they. I think all of that would lend itself really to some fascinating strands of research. You did what you had to do with <laughs> your amazing books, and now also the Italian readers can uh, enjoy your uh, wonderful work. And we hope to have also an, uh, an Italian edition of the second book very soon. 
Simon, I have to. Uh, I I would love to, uh, as you know, talk to you, to you for for hours, uh, days probably, uh, with a cup of tea. Uh, 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 but unfortunately, I we have to um, to end the this amazing conversation. I thank you very much for your time for talk uh, about the, your work with us. Um, e adesso eh, anche con gli ascoltatori del, del, nostro, eh, del nostro video eh, eh, posso dire che abbiamo finito la nostra conversazione con, con eh, Simon Gilson che ringrazio moltissimo e eh, con tutti voi eh, do, eh, vi do appuntamento al prossimo dei dialoghi di Rosvisaglia e nel frattempo auguro delle buone feste grazie e a presto Grazie a te Natale.